My name is Eli Wax. I'm from Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, and I'm 17 years old. Now, I'll venture a guess that most of you don't know who I am. I'm from a continent away, and until recently, I wasn't even tall enough to go on most of the rides at amusement parks. That said, I'm truly honored to speak today to a room full of amazing millennials and globals. My organization, High School Heroes X, provides youth a platform to innovatively solve local problems. And buzzwords aside, what that boils down to is that whatever youth are passionate about, from mental health to the environment, we'll be there to help them affect meaningful change. To do so, I've learned that the most imperative thing is to leverage any seemingly bad event as a good one and turn all seemingly good events into great ones. Achieving this requires two traits, tenacity and optimism, both of which youth tend to have in abundance. And so today, I hope to convince you all that by using these two traits, you can thrive in launching any initiative or solving any problem you set your mind to. For today's chat, I'm going to talk about the journey of our Philadelphia Education Challenge from start to completion. I founded High School Heroes X almost two and a half years ago. I was 14. My voice was higher than that of Mickey Mouse. I certainly cannot go on all of the big roller coasters back then, and I had absolutely no credentials. All I had was an idea, and it came from a book called Abundance, The Future is Better Than You Think by Peter Diamandis. The book talks about how the world's greatest challenges can be overcome and are being overcome by a combination of innovation and near ubiquitous access to technologies. Everything from mobile phones to 3D printers. After reading the book, I reached out to Dr. Diamandis, who encouraged me, as a high school student, to look out my own window and identify local problems that needed solving. Before I could do that, though, I needed to find students my age who shared my passions, making my community a better place and inherently the world just a bit better. I thus went out and emailed every school in my area. I scavenged lists of local students looking for any possible connections or leads. However, the rejections came in shortly thereafter. I was told by one school that, quote, if they were interested, they would get back to me. They never did. While another told me that they had way too much going on that quarter to have anything to do with Heroes X. Meanwhile, a student who ran most of the service events for his school and had served many leadership positions as well told me it didn't seem to mesh with his interests. Now, I said at the beginning of this chat that it is beyond important to leverage any seemingly bad event as a good one. And as paradoxical as that may seem, especially for something as black and white as a rejection email, bear with me for just one minute. While I was obviously upset, even a bit disappointed by these early rejections, I realized it was pointless to dwell on the past because it couldn't be changed. It's really easy to look back, to say, what if? To say, what if I wrote a better email? What if this great school joined on to say, I regret X and I regret Y? But it's looking back in the past for too long that costs us our future. And I had a lot I still wanted to do. So instead of, letting, instead of getting down, I let the doubt of others fuel my passion. I kept striving for my goals, kept emailing those same schools and students, optimistic that something would come of my efforts, while knowing that nothing's guaranteed or deserved. To my chagrin, struggles weren't too hard to find. They even occurred at my own school, as I saw the organization High School Villains Y, created by a group of fellow classmates, show up on my Facebook newsfeed one night. It stated mission to take down me and to take down Heroes X. It hurt seeing comments like this at my own school, where I even found myself on the back page of this satirical student newspaper, and not in a good way. But I persevered, and at long last, positive news started flowing in. Three schools signed on to have me start working with their students to research the area's biggest problems, one even allowing me to speak in an assembly to promote High School Heroes X. Now, the setup of the organization is that we allow students to design challenges for fellow students to solve. In this, we have everybody come together in what we call a challenge design workshop, where students discuss the biggest issues that plague their community and define tangible metrics which must be met in order to show clear improvement in the challenge area and deem a winner. I entered September of 2014 with three schools signed on, wanting to have a six school sign on for a challenge design session I tentatively planned for the end of October. To meet this goal, well, I had to push back my bedtime and quite a bit. I sent follow-up email after follow-up email, trying to convince schools and students alike that I wasn't crazy and that yes, even at our young age, we are capable of solving important issues. I tried to persuade schools that if they trusted me, 
I wouldn't let them down, and I would empower their students to make their mark on the world. Sales pitch aside, I was speaking to people many decades my senior, and my street cred was quite low. But somehow I did it. And by the time recession rolled around, seven schools sent students who had identified over 20 issues in the area needing solving. After a few hours of debate, we decided to try to focus on the challenge that was the major education gap in the city. Perhaps with a bit of naivete, thinking that as students, we understood the system. Side note, we definitely did not. We nonetheless dove into a challenge wanting to confront a major local problem. The fact that Philadelphia area high school students from economically disadvantaged areas had graduation rates far below the national average. Around 65% of students graduate high school, with even fewer than that going on to college, and even fewer than that graduating from college. Believing that education is one of the most important tools in life, and quixotically believing that just maybe we could make a world where everybody got a good education. Our challenge was designed around finding a system that provided students from the inner city the tools they needed to not just get to university, but to succeed in life. However, even this decision was fraught with perils. This is best exemplified when a school threatened to walk out of our challenge design workshop after the idea they had championed wasn't chosen by the majority. Nonetheless, I walked away extremely excited about our challenge, knowing we can make a big difference. I had the tenacity to get to this point, and now I needed the optimism in myself that I could truthfully tell our schools working on the challenge, that if they, tr that if they found innovative ways to disrupt, or, <laughs> okay, I'm sorry for the buzzwords, if they could find innovative ways to help affect meaningful change in inner city education, I would find an advisory board to help education nonprofits to assist, and most importantly, a school with which to work to test out their ideas. The, fir the way in which the first three members were added to our advisory board exemplify what I've said about opportunities. I arrived at the Forbes 30 Under 30 Summit excited to attend the pre-launch party where I'd mingle with all 1,000 attendees. However, I got there to learn that to enter the main event, you had to be 21 or over because they'd be serving alcohol. Now, as you may all be able to guess, because A, I said my age at the beginning of the speech, and B, because of my numerous height and voice pitch jokes, which undoubtedly are getting less funny with each repetition, I didn't quite fit the criteria. I never really imagined myself getting carded in life, nonetheless at a networking event, but I realized I'd be spending the opening night with only the other dozen or so attendees under 21 instead of the thousand. Unfortunate, I knew I'd have to make the best out of a bad situation. And this optimism turned out to be prescient. The first two members I met had arrived five minutes before me. And had they gone in, I likely never would have met them. Thankfully, I did meet Justin Lafazan and Dylan Gambardella. At 18, they co-founded Students for Students College Advisory. And in the challenge wanting to confront education and get students to graduate, I couldn't think of better people to add to the board. When I was told I wouldn't be able to enter the main event, I easily could have gone home. But with a bit of luck and a lot of optimism, you can turn any bad event into a good one. Now, the summit as a whole was good, but as stated, I knew I had to turn good events into great ones. So after the event, I went through the biography of every attendee, looking for people based in Philadelphia with an expertise relating to education. One night at around 3 a.m., I found the incredible Lauren Fine, a rising star in the legal field who, among other ventures, worked with teens exiting the juvenile justice system to go back to school. And challenged wanting to holistically confront education, wanting to both find ways to prevent students from dropping out to a life of crime and get those who had to go back to school and to graduate, I couldn't think of a better resource. With the advisory board starting to fill out, I looked for partners who could assist me and my chapter's ideas to further develop. Now, due to time, I won't go fully into the details of how I connected to these nonprofits, but the stories continue to show examples of optimism, perseverance, and taking chances. We were lucky to work with the Read by Fourth Literacy Initiative. At one of their events, I interacted with inner city students who told me they wished to read more about the world in a big way. I told this to one of my chapters, who in turn developed a curriculum based around discussing big world topics such as food and what it means to be a good citizen. We're also lucky enough to work with Libraries for All, a nonprofit which gave us many innovative ways to get students to read, as well as connecting us to other education nonprofits in the space. The conversation also led to one of our chapters developing a curriculum around innovative math games to complement the literacy initiative. Later, I had a transformative meeting with four students at Project Home, an organization which strives to educate and empower students from economically disadvantaged areas. The students told me that 
for a good part of their lives, they'd felt cast aside by society. Whether it be because of where they were born, the socioeconomic circumstance into which they were born, or simply the color of their skin. Amazingly, they weren't bitter about this, but expressed to me that the one thing they thought would give them a truly equal playing field in life was learning how to use technology, specifically 21st century exponential technology like 3D printing and how to collect big data points for AI. One of our chapters would go on to develop an amazing computer literacy curriculum to do just this. They taught students how to code using the MIT program Scratch, taught students how to type using innovative typing games online that allowed students to learn how to type quickly. They taught them how to make PowerPoints and so much more. And lastly, I met with the Netter Center at the University of Pennsylvania. I was both shocked and inspired by that meeting. I learned that in federal public housing, there is lead paint that students would often lick, and that floors were often covered in cockroach feces. Consequently, many children develop diseases while still young and spent copious amounts of time in hospitals with doctors and nurses. I took this information with me later that summer when I worked with what would become our partner school, where I had quite a few students tell me that they wanted to become doctors or nurses or paramedics even if they were unaware that they had to be strong in math and biology to do so. <coughs> the Netter Center was kind enough to share with us their career development curriculums, and two of our chapters would build off of them to design curriculums that would talk with students about their future careers. At the end of our five-week summer program, we had students wanting to be everything from forensic anthropologists to civil engineers. These two curriculums were combined with single-gender mentorship programs, which like all of our other summer programs, will continue into the future. Now, before any of the knowledge I mentioned above could shape into those curriculums, I had to find a school in which we could work with. It was June, and though I'd been in conversation with many schools, I was having a tough time getting any of them to commit. Then on June 16th, I got to meet with the Jesu School, and it was a match made in heaven. We worked with them for the preceding, we worked with them for five weeks this summer, and my students were amazed with how driven passionate and bright their students were. On the first, I had one boy at Jesu who was incredible. He had an infectious smile. He gave me a hug when I walked in every day. And more so than that, he also was just loved learning. As an award for winning one of our games, he got a book, I gave him a book on airplanes. The next day I walked in and he had beautifully drawn one of those planes to give to me as a gift. Overweight, the boy wanted to become a paramedic, he told me. I asked him why, and he said that as a child, he had to be rushed to the hospital after an asthma attack. The paramedic saved his life, and so he wanted to save lives himself. Incredibly admirable, I realized that he more so liked art, science, and history than biology and math. I worked with him to find a career that would both mesh with his interests and that would allow him to continue to help save lives. He was ebullient to learn that as a chemist, he could research chemical concoctions which could be cures for diseases. One girl was a star coder. On the first day of our computer literacy curriculum, we were taught students simply how to move a fox across the screen. She proceeded to rotate that fox, make that fox speak, and have that fox write her name on the screen. She also amazingly went on to help struggling students as soon as she was done. The five weeks at J, to conclude, I'd like to bring up one thing. To get to this point, it took a lot of work, and that work required a lot of tenacity and optimism. These two traits youth tend to have an abundance of, and put together, you're able to turn any bad situation into a good one. I think in life that there's only a win column. For you to either achieve your goal, or you realize you'll have to take another route to get there. And so today, I want to tell you that in the most unbridled optimism, that you take every opportunity you can, you'll gain a sense of tenacity to push you that much further to your goal. Youth have that optimism. Let's leverage it to change the world. Thank you. Tegelf, leading the change.